Today, I will try to explain you something that we go in, we, we do in the laboratory. And uh, I had this tentative title, this uh, provocative title, A Second Life for SRSF1 Transcript. And you know that um, alternative splicing is a potent mechanism for gene expression regulation and uh, all the, uh, RNA, the development of RNA sequencing and uh, bioinformatic approaches allowed to show that uh, approximately 92-94% of the transcript of the gene, human genes, encode for transcript that undergo alternative splicing. And these alternative splicing events are regulated during uh, development, and they are important for organogenesis, but they are also important for the ability of the cells to respond to a number of stimuli and uh, stressing conditions. So the, the alternative splicing is re a, as a really a real crucial um, role in the regulation of gene expression, and and uh, we know uh, a lot about the mechanisms that control alternative splicing, and in particular we, we know about uh, a number of RNA binding proteins that are splicing regulators. And the most famous family of splicing regulator is the family of SR splicing factors. And uh, here you can see here uh, a number of proteins that belong to this uh, family. And uh, uh, the, the in our laboratory, we in the last few years, we have uh, investigated this protein that was previously called splicing factor 2 or alternative splicing factor, depending on the laboratory that was involved in the analysis of this protein. And now it's called SRSF1. That means SR for, uh, for the name of the family and splicing factor 1. And the name of the family derives from the fact that all these proteins, you, you see here, they share a common structure. And all these proteins have a C-terminal uh, a portion, C-terminal domain, that is rich in serine arginine dipeptides. And these properties they gives the name to the family. So they are assumed to induce splicing, to promote um, inclusion of exons. And they uh, should act by interacting with the splicing regulatory element that are called an answer of splicing that it can be either in the exons or in the introns. We started the analysis of alternative splicing uh, in relationship to cancer, to the development cancer. And we decided to focus on uh, uh, alternative splicing of particular proteins that are the, uh, recep oh, the receptor tyrosine kinases. And this is a super family of proteins, of genes, that uh, you can see here includes 17 families. And all these proteins share a common structure with an extracellular domain, a transmembrane segment, and a, a, an intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. And uh, uh, by binding to the ligand, you have dimerization of the protein, and this is sufficient to activate the tyrosine kinase activity and to trigger uh, multiple signaling cascades. So the protein we are interested in is RON. And uh, RON belongs to the, uh, is the, mm, is the receptor for the macrophage stimulating protein and is a member of the cell scattering factor family. And uh, this, the prototype of this family is MET. So when you activate uh, RON, so when uh, uh, RON interacts with the macrophage simulating protein, you have the activation of the protein, of the tyrosine kinase, the activation of a number of signaling cascades, and the final outcome of this activation is invasive growth or cell scattering. And, and now this is, is a sort of, uh, uh, of, of a mechanism that is important that is called the mesenchymal uh, to epithelial cell transition, epithelial to mesenchymal cell transition, or EMT. 
And this is very important for cancer in during cancer development. You can see here two typical uh, epithelial and mesenchymal cells. So they share, they are clearly different, completely different. And uh, what is um, important and, uh, and gives you the idea of the extreme plasticity of the cell is the fact that you can move from this cell to this one and you can go back from mesenchymal to epithelial cells. And, and all these cells share uh, a, a, a polarity. This, uh, here you have a basal apical polarity. This is, in, in the case of mesenchymal cells, you have front-end polarity. But they are clearly different. And it's, it's really surprising that you can pass from, one, uh, from epithelial to mesenchymal cells. And there are three major changes that are associated with this uh, uh, transition. And of course, the first one is the morphological change. And the epithelial cells tend to grow in uh, layers. And they have very strong cell-cell contacts, whereas uh, mesenchymal cells are dispersed and uh, have a spindle shape morphology. Uh, moreover, of course, there are differences in the, in the type of proteins that are associated with epithelial or mesenchymal status. And in the case of epithelial cells, you have a strong expression of ecadherin, uh, whereas in the case of mesenchymal cells, you have a strong expression of imantin, for instance. But you have also uh, some alternative splicing events that are associated with uh, uh, EMT, the EMT process. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, what has been very carefully characterized is the alternative splicing of the fibroblast growth after receptor 2. And we know a lot of these, uh, of, uh, of these uh, alternative splicing events that involves two mutually exclusive axons. And this control, of course, by a number of RNA binding proteins, but it's also controlled by long uh, non-coding RNAs. Uh, and then uh, the main difference uh, between epithelial and mesenchymal cells is the fact that the epithelial cells cannot move uh, usually as single cells. I mean, you can have the movement of the entire layers of cells, but in the case of mesenchymal cells, uh, each mesenchymal cell is able to move independently. So when uh, uh, three classes of EMT have been described, or y you can also have the reversal of EMT, that is the mesenchymal to epithelial cells, so that this is met. You have three classes of EMT, and the first class is associated with uh, embryogenesis and uh, organogenesis. And, and this is the most physiological one. It occurs several times during uh, uh, embryogenesis. And you have both EMT and its reversal. So uh, this is essentially a program that is associated with embryogenesis. And in fact, in nodal cells, in nodal in, uh, individuals, you have almost never EMT. And EMT is associated with uh, mainly with wood healing. Okay? But it's also exploited by cancer for the cancer dissemination. And this is the idea that has been proposed several years ago. And the idea is that um, cells in the, um, in the main carcinoma uh, suffer a number of stressing conditions, uh, hypoxia, acidification, lacks of nutrient, and they respond to the, all these uh, uh, events, all these stresses, try a way uh, to escape the tumor, to invade other organs in, and, and find better conditions for life. And this, a, a way to escape the primary tumor is to undergo EMT because now cells in the primary carcinoma that are epithelial cells, these cells undergo EMT. They acquire the ability to move as single cells, to invade blood and lymphoid vessels, and to spread out throughout the organism. 
Uh, uh, but uh, for the formation of metastasis, what is required also the reversal of EMT that is met because with the mesenchymal to epithelial cell transition. Now the cells uh, return to an epithelial status and they stop moving and they can form colonies and new cancer. So the um, uh, RON is uh, implicated in, a situ in, uh, in, in, this, in this phenomenon. And uh, several years ago, the group of Comoglio in Torino describe an alternative splicing of RON that is shown here, a particular alternative splicing of RON in which you have skipping of this axon, that is axon 11, and you have the production of what is called delta RON. And because of this uh, skipping, there are a number of different um, uh, structural differences in the protein. The protein cannot be processed in a, in a regular way. In and, uh, uh, and actually what happens is that uh, uh, this protein that is deleted uh, of 49 amino acid in the um, uh, extracellular domain, this protein is constitutively active. It does not require to bind to MSP to be activated. So it conveys always a si a, a, the same signal to the cells. The cells have to move. So it, it is sufficient to express delta RON to have to confer an invasive phenotype to the to the cells. But what is important is that this uh, alternative splicing event, skipping of exon 11, is not due to a mutation in uh, any regulatory sequence. The gene is identical to the gene that you have in normal cells, but is due instead to a deregulation of splicing. And deregulation of splicing is something that occurs uh, usually, that is a common feature of cancer, and is due to, for instance, altered activity or altered expression of splicing factors. So you have not a particular mutation, but for instance, also the um, acidification of the, of the, of the micro tumor microenvironment uh, due to uh, the, the extreme growth of cells or uh, hypoxia can induce alteration in the splicing program and can produce alteration in uh, the splicing of this, of this particular gene. So the alternative splicing of exon 11 is not something typical of uh, cancer cells. And you as you can see here, these are RNA, commercial RNA from different uh, uh, human tissues. And you can see that in all tissues, you can see RON and delta RON. So this is something that normally occurs in the cells. But if you take RNA from uh, uh, breast and colon cancer, you can see that there are uh, uh, cases in which you have a massive production of delta RON. So there is a deregulation of this alternative splicing in, uh, in tumors. And so what is controlling the alternative splicing of RON? There are s now we know that there are several factors that control the alternative splicing of this uh, proton cogene. But uh, for the, uh, today, I, I, ah, I think there is something wrong with, OK. But today, I will focus on SRSF1, because we have shown that the expression of level of SRSF1 is actually involving control in the alternative splicing of RON. And in this case, for instance, we overexpressed uh, uh, SRSF1 uh, fused to the T7 epitope. And what happens is that this is sufficient. This is a modest increase in the abundance of SRSF1 in the cells. Actually, there is a decrease in the level of the endogenous protein, a modest increase in the level of uh, uh, the ectopic protein. But this difference is sufficient to clearly change the splicing program of RON is sufficient to induce the expression of delta RON that is in Western blot analysis. And here you can see that the, uh, this delta RON is active because it's phosphorylated. So you have a modest, uh, the, the only difference between these cells is this expression of SF2 or SRSF1 fused at T7, but it's not a hundredfold increase, a twofold increase or something like that. 
And uh, uh, since SRSF1 induces the expression of delta rho, SRSF1 expression over expression is sufficient to induce uh, cell motility. That is uh, another uh, feature uh, uh, that uh, indicates the occurrence of EMT. And uh, uh, when you overexpress RSF2, there is also a difference in the morphology of uh, epithelial cells. And you have also a down regulation in the expression of uh, ecadrin. So there is something that is, uh, 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 that all these data implicate SRSF1 in the EMT process. And, and now we know that also uh, HRPA1, HRPH, and other factors can, be con can control this particular splicing event, but mm, this is not the, 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 the topic of uh, my talk today. So uh, what is uh, another thing that is I I interesting is that, I is that uh, how SRSF1 control alternative splicing, this particular alternative splicing event. And usually, as I told you before, a splicing factor of the SR family and in general a splicing factor of SRSF1 uh, uh, induce exon inclusion and they bind either in the uh, exon itself or in the uh, flanking introns. But in this case, what happens is that SRSF1 binds to uh, a, a splicing enhancer in the downstream exon and in this way induces skipping of this axon. So it's a completely different uh, from what uh, usually expected because it's, it does not produce uh, inclusion, but it produces skipping. And, uh, and, and this was the first case uh, of uh, 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 axon skipping produced by SRSF1, but very recently the group of Adrian Craner that has characterized in detail this protein um, Adrian Craner has shown by uh, genome-wide analysis and, uh, uh, that uh, ab about 50% of the alternative splicing events controlled by splicing factor SRSF1 actually are due to um, uh, exon skipping. So in order to study more in detail this, uh, this, this phenomenon, we have uh, uh, decided to investigate an in vitro model of EMT. And usually, uh, when you use an in vitro model for uh, EMT, you use models in which you promote EMT by overexpressing particularly uh, particular uh, transcription factors, such, such as twist, uh, slug, uh, uh, that uh, when you overexpress these factors, you induce, you force. Um, EMT process, uh, and but we use a completely different mechanism. There was the uh, a completely different um, model that was developed in this, uh, described in this paper, uh, published on uh, PNS, and uh, and and this is based on cell density. So the idea is that uh, that when you have a tumor and the cells in the in the center part of the tumor suffer um, a number of uh, uh, stressing conditions. And, uh, 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 but they are also forced to, to acquire a sort of uh, epithelial cells. Whereas when you um, see the cells have very low density, they are able to move around uh, uh, the plate and are more similar to um, uh, mesenchymal cells. And so uh, when you see that these cell lines that are SW480 cells, that are colon adrocarcinoma cells, you can see them at high density in the high density, they express ecadrin, and they express less vimentin. And, uh, and since they express ecadrin, beta catenin is uh, cytoplasmic, whereas if you see the same cells at low density, they do not express ecadrin, and beta catenin translocate to the cell nucleus and uh, uh, regulates genes that are involved in the EMT process. So it's a very simple. You, you change the, the, the cell density and you induce a sort of EMT. It's not a complete EMT. It's not so strong as when you overexpress a transcription factor, but you have regulation of genes that are involved in the EMT process. And what happens when you uh, use this system? You, you can see that the high density 
you have mainly expression of RON, that is typical of epithelial cells, whereas at low density, you have expression of delta RON, that is typical of mesenchymal cells. And this is accompanied by a difference in the expression of splicing factor SRS1. So what is the mechanism that control the expression of SRS1, the differential expression of SRS1 in these cells? And the mechanism is, in, is uh, related to the uh, NMD process. Because when you, uh, by alternative splicing, if you introduce a stop codon, or if you introduce a a, a, an exon junction complex downstream of the stop codon, now the RNA is degraded by the nonsense mediated RNA decay pathway. And in the particular case of uh, splicing factor SRSF1, you have a, 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 splice, a, a splice, an intron in the 3' UTR region, and because of this, an exon junction complex is. Uh, uh, assembled downstream of the natural stop codon. Now the natural stop codon is, is recognized as a premature stop codon and the RNA is degraded. So this is the idea. It's a very simplified uh, model. But this, uh, the, this mechanism works uh, uh, for the, to control the uh, level of a number of proteins involved in RNA metabolism. And it's part uh, usually of a feedback mechanism. So when you increase the, le the level of the protein, you change the splicing profile, and then you degrade the RNA by NMD, and so you degrade the, pro the level of the protein, and you change again the splicing profile of the, of the transcript, and, and so on. And so you maintain the level rather constant the level of the RNA uh, and uh, the level of the protein in that particular cell type. And what happens is that this mechanism war, uh, works in the case of splicing factor SF2 and is controlled by, um, by cell density. And, uh, and you can, uh, for instance, you can block the, ND, the NMD process by targeting uh, UPF1 that is a member of uh, the NMD um, uh, system, or you can uh, uh, alter the LM, uh, you can block the NMD process, for instance, with the cyclohexamide that blocks the first round of translation, and then you change the uh, abundance of uh, uh, SRSF1 transcript. So, uh, in order to investigate better this system or to gain insight in the how it works, so we, we perform this experiment. You can take cells, see the cells at high density, and uh, grow the cells for, uh, at high density for 16 hours. Then you can take the medium from a high density cells with, that we call preconditioned medium, and you can put this medium to, ce to cells that have been seeded at low density and see what happens. And this is sufficient to change the splicing profile of SRSF1. It's sufficient to change the, the level of SRSF1 and to modulate the splicing profile of RON, and also to affect the expression of e cadherin by mantin, and so on, and, and also the distribution of beta catenin So you can, there is something in the medium that is sufficient to induce this kind of EMT. It's not complete is not identical to what we observe when see the cells at the two different cell density, but it is somehow related to that. And, uh, and since uh, uh, it's known that the ERK has a major role, that the ERK cascade has a major role in uh, controlling uh, uh, the, uh, the activity of the cells the, and uh, to integrate signals that come from the uh, extracellular environment, we tested the if ERK activity is modulated by cell density, and this is the case. Uh, high density, you have down regulation, you have uh, the switch off of ERK, and a similar a decrease in the level of ERK phosphorylation you can observe also when low density cells are grown in the presence of preconditioned and medium. And again, if you inhibit ERK with this compound, now you can change the splicing profile of SRSF1, and you change also the splicing profile of RON. So ERK is uh, involved, and, uh, and uh, it controls also the expression of cadherin and vimentin. And uh, we also show that ERK uh, acts through SAM68, because when you overexpress SAM68, it, that is a target, of RON and is phosphorylated by RON, 
uh, by um, ERC. Uh, when you overexpress SAM68, you induce a change in the splicing profile of SRSF1, and you change the level of SRSF1 and density cells, and so on. And you have also morphological differences in the cells. So there this altogether, you can put all these uh, all these uh, um, data in in a picture, no? Because in uh, low density SW480 cells, there is a constitutive activation of RAS because RAS is mutated, and this means uh, activation of ERK phosphorylation of some 68 inhibition of this particular. Uh, splice, uh, splicing in the 3' prime UTR, and this results in a higher level of SRS, uh, SRSF1, changes the splicing profile of RON with the production of delta RON, and this activates ERK uh, again. So this is a sort of circuit that you can introduce. But when you grow the same cells in a medium, preconditioned medium from high density cells, you, you change something, and now you are no longer deactivation of ERK, no longer phosphorylation of SAM68. You are splicing on this particular intron, and this results in a lower expression of SRSF1. Expression of RON, and RON is no active unless it interacts with the ligand. And so you have a modification of this uh, regulatory system. And I will stop here because I think I already took too much. Thank you very much.